que sí, Tara, take it away. Let me know if you see it. Here in British Columbia, innovation is everywhere. From how we engage with natural resources to evolving transportation and creating industry-defining technologies, BC innovators are putting their mark on tomorrow and addressing the crucial social, economic, and environmental challenges we face around the world. And at Innovate BC, we help foster the ideas and solutions emerging out of our province so that all British Columbians can benefit from a thriving and inclusive innovation economy. So, what does that mean? We are champions of innovation and change makers, relationship builders and community connectors, drivers of ecosystem data and storytellers. We work to create more opportunities for everyone to participate in our innovation ecosystem, working with strategic partners in BC and beyond. And our programs are designed to connect innovators to the resources they need to succeed. Looking to start and scale your business or learn how to navigate human resources? digital marketing, or intellectual property. We'll connect you with experts in your field and mentors to help your business grow. Need funding? Our grant programs can help you hire talent, commercialize your research, and validate your technology. Searching for innovative solutions to your most pressing challenges? Tap into our network of BC's most promising innovators and solution providers. We help companies large and small across industries drive innovation forward. Because BC is the best place to start, grow, and invest for tomorrow. Begin today and grow your idea with us. Innovate BC. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Innovate BC. It is Tuesday. Uh, we didn't have a session last week, so it's good to be back. Good to have you here. My name is Michelle. I'm joining from uh, Miskwachewa Skygen, Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I welcome you wherever you're joining from today. You know, I think it's always important to acknowledge, you know, the gift of the, this land that we get to live on and you know, just walk in good relationship with. So always take that moment to just extend gratitude. We we are part of you know, creator's beautiful world. And it's important to acknowledge that and remember that. So welcome, welcome. I'm looking forward to today's presentation. I hope you are as well. Um, there's opportunity at the end for any questions or comments that you might have about today's presentation. But if you have questions along the way the during the presentation, just put them in the chat box and I'll make sure I make note of them. All right, so let's get on with today's webinar. So we got two ladies from the First Nations Finance Authority in Canada. So they're going to give a presentation about financing social, economic, and infrastructure projects for the First Nations government. So you're here because you wanted to learn about the FNFA, which was created to provide First Nation governments with access to the same types of affordable financing that all other governments can access. So we will learn how the FNFA's low rate capital can support your community social, economic and infrastructure projects. So they will review the benefits of membership the steps to borrowing and share, and we love this part, sharing some inspiring stories from First Nations who have accessed FNFA financing for their community projects. Sounds great. I look forward to those stories. All right, so we got Donna who's joining us. She is the associate member, or sorry, the associate director for member services. Um, Donna provides leadership support for the member services department to increase awareness of FNFA and to assist First Nation governments with ac accessing capital markets and investment products through membership with the FNFA. So she is a member of the Coldwater Indian Band and... Donna, you're going to have to help me say this. Which nation? Thank you. Um, the, it's the Enklep Kimbo nation. And if anyone here knows more than me and is more familiar with that name, they're welcome to correct me, but that's how I've been saying it. 
it's thank a tough one. you. <laughs> I would have never come up with that on my own. So I appreciate that. So Donna lives in Squamish, BC, the traditional territory of the people of that area. Um, she's with her husband and two children where they spend their free time exploring the mountains. Love that and coastlines that surround them. And then we have Sybil Campbell, who is the member services manager, Central BC and mainland. So as the member services manager, Sybil manages current and potential members of the FNFA to achieve capital projects. Uh, she is a member of the Musqueam Indian Band, a Coast Salish community located in beautiful, I'm gonna put that in there, Vancouver. She has experienced working with the BC AFN Vice Chief Office, the Musqueam Lands Management Department, and Chief and Council. She lives in West Bank, BC, the traditional territory of the Okanagan Nation, with her partner and son. I always love this. Our passion is traveling throughout BC, finding great lakes to fish in the summer. I love those little fun facts. So welcome to our guests. We honor, we are honored that you've joined us this afternoon and you're going to inspire us, lend us some knowledge about what you have going on in your organization. So I'm going to pass this virtual mic off to both of you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michelle, for that wonderful introduction. Um, Sybil and I are both really happy to be here and appreciate the invitation from Can Do and Innovate BC to share some information about the First Nations Finance Authority. I'm going to share my screen because we have a presentation to share. And while I do that, I just want to acknowledge that I am calling today from the traditional unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. It's where I'm very fortunate to, to work and live. Um, Sybil, did you want to uh, let everyone know where you're calling in from as well? I'm calling in from West Bank, BC, and I'm on the traditional territory of the Celix people. Amazing. Thanks, Sybil. So Sybil and I are going to go bounce back and forth with um, introducing everyone to the First Nations Finance Authority, telling you what it is that we do, how we do it. And then, of course, um, a big part of this is going to be sharing some of the amazing projects that we've supported across or that the FNFA has supported across British Columbia. Um, before we start, though, or just to start at the beginning, um, it's really good to tell you a little bit about what the FNFA is. So the First Nations Finance Authority operates and um, was created under the First Nations Fiscal Management Act, um, as well as the financing secured by other revenues regulations. We were established to promote internal capacity um, for First Nation governments, as well as to assist with accessing low rate loans. The, or sorry, the act was established to do that. It was really designed to allow First Nations to leverage their own source revenues or OSRs or property tax, also known as local revenues. And so there are four institutions that operate under this act. The First Nations Financial Management Board or FMB uh, is created to provide the capacity development. The FNFA provides access to the, um, the capital markets through financing. The First Nations Tax Commission assists communities who have, or First Nation governments who have a tax regime. And then the latest, addition to um, the institutions is the First Nations Infrastructure Institute, which supports uh, First Nation governments with large capital projects. Okay, so those are all the institutions that operate underneath the Act. The First Nations Finance Authority, if we were just to talk really about what it is that we do, well, we're a not-for-profit statutory institution. Okay, we um, are governed by a board of directors that is comprised of elected chief and council members from across Canada. They all belong to um, uh, First Nations that are members with the FNFA, and they were all elected to the board by the membership. FNFA's membership is comprised of First Nation governments from across Canada. We were created really to level the playing field to provide First Nation governments with access to the same types of low rate capital 
right? Loans with lower interest rates that other levels of government can, um, can obtain. So we're really excited about the offerings that FNFA can provide for First Nation governments, and we'll describe those more as we move forward. Um, Sybil, over to you. Do you want to introduce the Board of Directors? Sure thing. So like Donna said, our Board of Directors are elected delegates from our membership, and they are all across Canada. And we like that. We like to have an elected delegate from each province, if possible, not always the case. So they are our board of directors for one year and they are reelected and new members can, can be put in the pool at our AGM that's done in July. Amazing, thanks Sybil. So yeah, there's our board of directors. There's more information about each of them on our website as well. We have a number of different First Nation members just in British Columbia. They're all across Canada. I focused on BC for this particular presentation, but in total, they've borrowed around 262.8 million. In total, there are 66 First Nation members that are First Nations that have become members of the FNFA. Um, Sybil, would you like to talk about uh, Nisqamla? I definitely can. So Nisqamlith is actually one of the files that I manage, currently manage. They're newer to me just because we have broken it up a little bit now, but they have, we provided the funding for their daycare center. And this daycare center is, has become so successful for First Nations and non-First Nations. They currently have a waiting list. Uh, they are unique in the fact that they do a lot of First Nations gatherings and teachings to all of the kids who attend the daycare. And they like to do more made toys. So anything that's done with woods, materials, so all natural base. And it's just super exciting because I've been a part with FNFA since 2019 to see how successful they have done with their daycare center. Amazing. Thanks, Sybil. Yeah, that's one of my favorite projects because <laughs> childcare is so important. I don't think it really matters what part of the province you're in um, and what the demand is, but having good quality childcare is really important, especially for our First Nation communities. Yeah. So in order to borrow with the First Nations Finance Authority, um, it's important first to, to let everyone know that a First Nation government has to become a member. And so there are steps um, that are required to become members. One of the first one is for a First Nation government that's operating under the Indian Act. Um, they have to voluntarily schedule under the First Nations Fiscal Management Act. That's done with the band council resolution and the letter that's sent to CERNAC. And we have all the templates in place to assess to assist a First Nation with submitting that information. Once that's complete, a First Nation government will work with the First Nations Financial Management Board, or FMB. And that's where they will work towards completing a financial administration law, or we call it a FAL as well as obtaining a financial performance certificate or an FPC. The FPC is um, the process to receiving that is really, it's a re review that FMB does of a nation's um, last five years financial statements. They'll crunch some numbers, um, uh, apply some ratios. And then if each of those ratios, I believe there are five or six of them, if those, those are passed, then a financial performance certificate is, um, is given. Once a First Nation has the FAL in place and they've received the financial performance certificate, they can then request membership with the FNFA. And that's where Sybil or I would come in to assist uh, a First Nation government with the next steps. It's fairly straightforward and it doesn't take that long. Usually it's, um, well, it, it is a two different band council resolutions, a BCR requesting membership and also a BCR designating an elected representative to the FNFA. Um, we also request the last five years financial statements as well as a copy of that file on FPC that was obtained from FMB. Our staff are here to assist every step of the way to make sure that the process is as smooth as possible. Once membership is obtained, 
then a First Nation can request financing from the FNFA. Okay, so this is a description of our different loan programs that we have in place, as well as our investment programs. So we have two loan programs. The first is a short-term loan. We also refer to it as interim financing. This has a rate of 6.25%. That's 0.95 basis points below um, bank prime. So it's a still, even at that level, it's a competitive rate. When a First Nation borrows in this program, they're paying interest only. The interest rate is not fixed. So if the rate goes up or down, then the interest only payments would also go up and down. Um, and for those of you that are watch the Bank of Canada rates, this particular loan rate is tied to the Bank of Canada rate. So when those go down, and I'm hoping that they will only go down from this point forward, then the interest on our interim financing or short-term loan will also go down. Communities will use this for um, when they have like a large capital project with a construction phase, if they want to um, you know, manage their cash flow, they can do interest only payments during that key construction phase, right? They'll also use it if they're wanting to enter our long term loan program, which is debenture financing. Debentures are issued once or twice a year. So rather than wait for the next debenture, the interim financing can um, bridge the gap between when a nation needs the money, right? And then when the next debenture is released. So second program, long term loans, also called debenture financing. These have terms that are, this loan program has terms that are fixed for 10 years, but the loan can be amortized over 30 years, which works great for those really big loans that go um, with a, a large capital project, like a community or admin center or, you know, something of a significant amount. FNFA has issued 10 debentures since 2014. Um, our last debenture had a 4.28% fixed rate for 10 years. Um, that was just issued in January 2024. Our current projected rate is 4.5%. It's market-based. It may change. Um, we're hoping that if it does change, it goes down. Okay. Um, and we also offer investment and capital advisory services. So we have a short-term investment fund um, at 5.4%. It's really flexible, as well as um, locked in for one-year terms um, at 5.35%. <clears throat> Oops, sorry, guys. There we go. Um, Sybil, would you like to talk about this project? Yeah, for sure. So I know I'm not going to say the nation's name correctly because I always get Ian, my coworker, to say it. So I'll just leave that out. <laughs> I've had the pleasure of working with them as well. And they did this government's community center. It is solar paneled. So that's one of the things that they had done. They were one of the first out there to complete a project like that. It is a gorgeous facility. I've seen multiple pictures of it. Super proud of them for doing it. And they just keep on excelling in different projects and stuff that they continue to do. Awesome. Thanks, Sybil. I think it's Kalko Wistahau. Is anyone here from Saskatchewan? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on. Let's carry on. Um, all right, the FNFA Investment Fund. Oh, Sybil. So the FNFA Investment Fund is a relatively new service that we offer not only to our members, but to anyone. So you don't have to be a member of FNFA to participate in our investment fund. As Donna said, our 5.40% is, uh, it's almost like a high interest savings account. So it's not locked in. So you can take money out at any time. As you go on, you get the interest rate fluctuates depending on the term that you choose to lock in that money. So even at a five year, 5.7% 5 is a really good locked in rate. And being locked in, you have to wait out the full term to access that. So this just gives a little bit more flexibility for communities who have money sitting there. And they know that we're not gonna use that at this time. So why not invest it and make a little bit of money on the side? Awesome, thanks. So, well, did you wanna talk about some of our member projects as well? Yeah, for sure. So we offer our loans for economic and social development, which is a large scope. So I have been here since 2019 and there hasn't been a project that FNFA has not been able to fund. 
We have not turned any nation away for any project that they've set out to do. We've assisted them along the way. So we have done 2 billion in loans for 87 nations. We've built multiple homes. We've done housing projects. We've done um, senior facilities, um, housing facilities for the band. So multi, I should say multi-housing. Uh, we did a very unique project in uh, Ontario where, and it's Northern Ontario. So if anyone's on here from Northern Ontario knows it can be quite a distance to even go to school. So students can take two hour bus rides in to go to school, two hour bus rides back, plus a full day at school. Cuts out a lot of extracurricular activities that they can do. So we were able to fund them to purchase a home closer to all the schools so it was more central. So they could stay there during the week, participate in all the extra activities that most students get to do, and then go home on the weekends. Very proud of that project. <laughs> It's helped uh, so many students be able to participate in a lot of extra activities. That's really important for students while they're going to school. Um, Multi-land purchases. So we also do land purchases for First Nations who want to convert it back into reserve land. So we're a little bit different on a bank that way as well. We don't put any holds on it. So whereas a bank it's held and then once the loan is done, they can convert the land. We don't put that stipulation on First Nations. So we've done wellness centers, um, power projects. So we've done windmill, solar, we've done a dam, roads, like it just an endless supply of projects. So any questions you have about different projects that you think your nation might be interested in, just give us a call, we'll be able to assist. Awesome. Thanks, Sybil. Um, this one's for you as well, but if you want me to take over. <laughs> so as you can see, we do the loans all across Canada. I'm not going to go through every province. On here, you can see the amount of money in loans that we've issued for uh, First Nations across Canada. It continues to grow. We're excited about that. Eventually, we'd like to see it even out across the way through Canada. We're getting there. Um, so as I said, $2 billion in loans all the way across. We've created 22,000 jobs, and the economic output from that has been $4.5 billion. So we have uh, a lot of First Nations have done hotels and stuff as well. So they've not only provided jobs for their local areas, it's also brought people there to provide a revenue for that area. Very exciting. Awesome, thanks, Sybil. Um, yeah, I can chat about this next project right here. This is the Long Plain First Nation in Manitoba. They used FNFA financing to support the, um, the development and construction of this amazing microtel in and suites by Wyndham. So it's located in Portage La Prairie, which is outside of Winnipeg. Um, I feel like if it's close to Long Plain First Nation, it's like maybe an hour or two out. Um, but what's great about this particular project is that um, the hotel has created opportunities for Portage La Prairie to um, compete for some larger conferences and events that they otherwise wouldn't be able to put bids in because they didn't have enough accommodation. So it's something that's worked well for Long Plain First Nation, but also for the neighboring communities. Um, since then, Long Plain First Nation has actually opened up a second hotel um, just inside of uh, Winnipeg that is really popular and an incredible facility. It's really beautiful. Samuel, did you want to talk about the Clearwater deal? I can do that. You, you can probably add to it as I go. Um, so Clearwater deal is one of uh, a deal that we assisted with seven Mi'kmaq communities in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, where they have become 50% owners of Clearwater Seafoods in partnership with premium bands based in BC. So they 
will eventually, sorry, Donna, they're looking to become 100% owners? Um, yeah, I'm, you know, I think that's, um, I've heard that that's one of Chief Terrence Paul's long-term objectives um, with Clearwater. Um, for now, I believe that they are 50% owners. And one yeah. of the cool things about this project is that the seven Mi'kmaq communities purchased the Clearwater, um, uh, their portion of the Clearwater together. And they did that by each becoming members of the FNFA and each borrowing independently and putting the proceeds of their financing towards the purchase. So it, it required a lot of collaboration um, on from all parties, but the result has been fantastic and a real winner for each of these communities. Um, the uh you know it was one of those projects that was heard all over the news when it actually happened i think around the end of 2020 beginning of 2021 so we're really happy to be a part of it okay so the first nations finance authority we help first nation governments with accessing capital for their for their projects we don't actually have like a bank account with a ton of money. Instead, what we do is we go to the capital markets, to the investors, and from there we raise the capital so that we can lend it to our First Nations. We're able to do that because we have investor grade credit ratings from three of the top rating agencies or companies in the world, Moody's Investor Service, S&P Global Ratings, and then more recently, DVRS Morningstar. So these companies provide a financial report card to every government, right? And they've accepted that FNFA's membership is comprised as government. So we're able to access this really special credit rating, which then allows us to attract the investors um, who invest the their, their money in a safe and stable place at really good rates that are beneficial to our First Nation members that borrow from us. Another way that we attract investors is um, we've started to track and report um, all of our projects under the ESG, um, Environmental Social or Governance, or the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, we do that so that we can show the investors how our loans and our projects um, qualify as either ESG or SDG. Pretty much every single project that we do has a social component to it because it's a First Nation government that's operating. Even if they're doing a business, they're doing that for the benefit of their communities in most cases. So when we do that, we're able to attract more investors at better rates. It's been really beneficial for us to assemble this information and share it with the investors. And it's been, of course, really beneficial for the First Nation members that borrow from us. Okay. Um, here's an example of a uh, of recent loan that we did. Um, well, I say recent, it was in September 2016, so not that long ago. <laughs> but Slixica <laughs> Nation in Alberta, they um, borrowed from the FNFA so that they could build the Chief Crowfoot School. So the school needed to be built because their previous school had significant damage from the Bow River floods in 2014. So I don't know if you recall hearing about it on the news, but Calgary um, and surrounding areas, including the Siksika Nation, were really impacted by flooding from the Bow River. I had actually seen some of the damage that had happened in the water lines, and it was unbelievable um, in Calgary, that is. So they needed a new school. They um, Their option were to go on the federal wait list to have the government of Canada pay for a new school, but that could take decades. They didn't want to wait decades because if they did during that time, the, the children in their community would have to take buses and go outside of the community to obtain an education, which isn't always ideal. So they took matters into their own hands. They borrowed from the FNFA. They built a school that they wanted on their own terms. They're still on that waiting list to have Canada fund the school. It just might take some time. But in the meanwhile, they have a school that they can use and that they're really proud of. So we're super happy for this particular project. So this, you can see it really hits all the marks when it comes to reporting that ESG um, information, right? It's a really amazing social project that benefits the community. 
Um, the next project that I've got here is the Hanvey Inlet First Nation in Ontario. They borrowed from the FNFA to become equity owners in the Hanvey Inlet Wind Farm. So this is a green energy project that we supported. And at the time, it was one of the largest projects that we had supported at the FNFA. So it was a big deal, especially for this community. They're a small little community in northern Ontario, not a lot of opportunity. And so because of the FNFA, they were able to participate in this project and become equity owners and as it's been told to me um, through our um, through uh, one of my coworkers who's in Ontario, it's a real rags to riches story. That's how the community themselves has described it, just from the opportunity that's resulted. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some uh, additional projects or uh, um, things that the FNFA is doing. And one of them that seems to gain a lot of attention and that people like to hear about is um, our work towards um, uh, forming a collective insurance model. So the FNFA is really supporting this insurance project. They've partnered with BFL Canada. And really what it is to, the intention is to provide First Nation governments with better options for insuring their assets on reserve, okay? It, the idea is to move towards a collective insurance model where First Nation governments who are interested would have ownership and then they would have like more control over the terms and better buying power. Um, it would be First Nations led and owned. So it's not going to be operated by the FNFA itself, but it's something that we're helping to to create so that First Nation governments have better options for insurance. From that, another type of project in, related to insurance has come up, and that is um around bonding insurance. So the FNFA is working with BFL to create a program where indigenous owned companies located on reserve can access bonding insurance. So if any of you are interested in learning more about that, please reach out. I'll connect you to Jody Anderson, who's really leading this project. Um, and, and she can share more information about where the rat, whether it's the asset insurance or the bonding insurance for First Nation governments on reserve. Okay, hey, another really cool initiative that we have that I'm really excited to share is FNFA has a podcast. It's called Let's Bond. And um, yeah, we've done one season in 2023. I think we've already done a second season in 2024. It's a great opportunity and a great way to learn more about the FNFA. Um, one of the most popular podcasts to date is episode number one. It's an interview with Ernie Daniels, who's our CEO and president, and it really gives a nice overview of his leadership journey. But I recommend listening to any one of them. It's a fantastic way to learn about FNFA and some of the projects that we've got going on. Um, you can listen to it on your favorite podcast app. If you just do a search for FNFA and Let's Bond, it should pop up. Okay. Over to you, Sybil. So Taku River is has done a hydro project. And they actually did this project before FNFA had gotten involved. And we offer refinancing. So we've offered that to quite a few, but in particular to Taku for the BC Hydro project, which freed up quite a bit of money for them. And they're quite remote community as well. So to free up all those additional funds for them helped them a lot. They're actually doing really well. We've helped them with a few other projects as well okay this is nipissing first nation in ontario i didn't have the opportunity to work directly with this community but i wanted to share this one with you just to show you what some of the options are so nipissing borrowed so that they could add solar power um, panels to a number of the different facilities you'll see that there's solar panels on their school seniors residence health center and admin office and I love sharing these type of projects because I know for a lot of First Nations across Canada, there's quite a number of us that are still reliant on diesel power, for example, to generate electricity for the communities. So to know that there's different options out there for communities um, and that the FNFA can support, I really uh, want to make sure that people are aware of that whether it's solar, um, hydro, wind, etc. There's definitely lots of options there. Sybil, can you talk about Red Pheasant Creek? Yeah, so Red Pheasant, we financed a gas bar and a convenience store for them. It has just opened up additional opportunity for them to have their own generated revenue. And it offers a place for 
local members, community members, and non-members to shop. Awesome. Thanks. All right, this next project is an oldie but a goodie. It's one of the early projects that the FNFA supported, and I can't stop sharing it. Um, it's the Songhees Nation over on Vancouver Island. They borrowed from the FNFA to build a wellness center. Uh, it's a 55,000 square foot multi-purpose building. It houses so many different programs and facilities. It's got a gym, a kitchen, a computer lab, learning space, rental space. It's it's fantastic. And as you can see, it's beautiful. Those big glass windows that you see, those face towards the ocean. So when you're inside the uh, the, the the West Coast and the Pacific Ocean is your view. It's really cool. Um, up next is Chiacht and Sybil. This one is probably one of my favorite projects th that we have recently done. So Tiacton actually worked with BC Housing, and this is the first time anything like this has ever happened. So BC Housing worked with Tiacton to put in this housing. So this housing has given the opportunities for band members to actually move back home that have been living off reserve. This gives them an opportunity to come back, to be integrated into their traditions, to become a part of their community again. It's seniors, families, young people. It's just absolutely amazing. So if anyone wants any additional information on how T. Acton has worked with BC Housing to be able to complete a project like that, reach out to me. I will, Lori with T. Acton is happy to answer any questions and assist anyone in this way if that's a project that they believe their community would love to do. Yeah, this is a really amazing and incredibly inspiring project. Thanks, Sybil. We also have, like, if you're looking for some inspiration, um, a great video on our website that describes the project in more detail. Okay, uh, one of the last projects that we'll talk about is Salt River First Nation. I always want to include this one um, uh, because uh, Salt River First Nation is our only borrowing member in the Northwest Territories. And uh, what they did was they borrowed from the FNFA to build this incredible multi-purpose business and conference center. Um, it includes space for the um, Northwest Territories government's um, courthouse and the because the courthouse is there, they have a long-term lease. The revenues from that long-term lease are used to help repay the loan that Salt River did with the FNFA, right? So it's a really nice way that they were able to package this and put it together. But most importantly, it creates a space for the community to gather, which we know is so important for First Nations. It's still missing for a lot of communities, including my own, right? Well, we have a tiny place to gather, but this is like a significant space to gather, not just for the Salt River First Nation, but for other communities around. Sybil? So on Williams Lake, they did, they've done multiple projects with FNFA. We're just going to take one to highlight. They did their admin building. It is a beautiful building. It offers quite a bit of different services that they have in there. One is it includes gathering space and uh, public art is absolutely everywhere there. It is, if you're ever in the area, it'd be worth just driving by. They're such an inspiring community, kind of remote, they're smaller and nothing stops them from moving forward. <laughs> Yeah, really, we've heard um, uh, they've presented at some of our past events before, and it's incredible the work that they've done. Thanks, Thank Sybil. So we've tried to give you a good overview of different First Nation communities that have borrowed from the FNFA all around Canada, multiple different types of projects, whether they're economic, green energy, social, um, but also uh, projects from First Nations that are small in size, but also some of the really big progressive um uh, successful ones that we've seen. So it's um, been an interesting journey to watch these First Nations as they take on their projects and then of course grow over the last 10 years. So this is um, Sybil and I, our contact information. I can share these slides with uh, um, Innovate BC to, to distribute afterwards if anyone is interested. But I think now we have time for questions. So I'm gonna 
stop sharing my screen once I figure out how. All right. Well, thank you so yep. much. Um, I know there's a couple questions, comments in the chat box. So Kaylee is asking any ideas on what causes the discrepancies across the provinces in, ex in accessing loans. For example, lack of economic opportunities in certain provinces, lack of capacity within communities to become an FNFA member. Good question. Yeah, that is a really good question. In some cases, it could be a lack of opportunity. For example, Northwest Territories, a lot of the First Nations located there are remote, but it just means that the opportunity isn't there right now. There could very well be things happening in the future that will make a difference for those nations. Um, the Yukon, you'll see, um, there, we don't have any um, nations that have borrowed or become members um, from the Yukon territories. And the main reason for that is that most nations in the Yukon are self-governing. So at the moment, we can't lend to any First Nations that are self-governing. Um, there has been amendment, an amendment to our act that will allow us. We just need to have all the, the fine print written and organized by, uh, by legal counsel, by lawyers, essentially. Sybil, so, did you want to add anything else to that? No, that pretty much hit it all. I think a lot of it is just capacity and because they're based on uh, own revenue source. So the nation has to be able, because we, we're not like a bank. We don't take security. We don't do holds. So it's based on generating own source revenue. Yeah. And it can change so quickly, too. I mean, yes. I think for the longest time, uh, Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada, we saw like just smaller loans, right, compared to the rest of Canada. That's changed a lot, especially with that Clearwater deal, where now Atlantic Canada, there's a significant amount of activity happening there and a larger loan portfolio in that region. And it changed a lot in BC when BC Gaming came. Mm -hmm. So that opened up a door for a lot of the smaller communities that, and a lot that are remote. It gave them that opportunity to turn to App and FA. Well, thank you. I When Sixica showed up, I just got really excited. I think I saw a Vincent, um, Chief Vincent in, in that one picture, um, wow. yellow, yellow old woman. And so Ken has a question about the Sixica school building. Why is it so tall? <laughs> <laughs> Can't answer that one. <laughs> um, probably could just be the angle of the way the picture was taken as well. My thought is that there's a gym there, which is <laughs> requires extra height. Yeah, that's a good answer. All right, and then Alyssa wants you to, she wants the connection with Jody for the insurance, so. Absolutely, Alyssa, let me know how I can get a hold of you um, or you can reach out to me and uh, I will connect you to Jody Anderson. Awesome. Are there any more questions out there before we we end today's webinar? I mean, we still have 10 minutes left. So there's opportunity for any questions or comments. We'd love to hear from you. I, I personally was impressed by, what was it? 22,000 plus, 22, plus jobs that, that have been created. Like talk about a, an economic economic development right there across across the nation. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's really exciting to see those types of results, so. Yeah, okay, think, well, it doesn't uh, appear, oh. When it comes to just the question about the insurance, um, have you guys worked with any groups that are getting insurance for reservoirs or dams for their communities? Um, so the insurance program is still at the feasibility and information gathering stage. So if there are any nations that are interested in talking to the FNFA about um, their experience in insurance and their interest in the insurance model that we're proposing, we'd be happy to connect them. Um, but in terms of being able to insure any project, we're not there. Well, the insurance program or the insurance model, it's not there yet. But I think that would be really interesting for um, uh, for Jody to to talk about as well. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, I'll definitely connect you, Alyssa. I'll write down your email. Thanks. Thank you. I sent it to you in the direct message. Awesome. Thank you so much, Donna. My pleasure. Um, I just want to say it's great to see Rocio and Shannon Smith from Stolo Community Futures here. It's a great organization located in the Stolo territories, um, providing support to Indigenous entrepreneurs. So hi, Rocio. Hi, Shannon. Hi, Donna. Hi, everyone. Great presentation. <laughs> Sorry, I had my light up. <laughs> great presentation and so great to learn more. There's Shannon as well. Uh, we've known not Donna for a few years and she's uh, incredible and excited to see her in this organiza organization doing great things. So glad to be part of it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love to see the support of one another. I love that. All right. Well, it doesn't appear as though there's any more questions. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Sybil and Donna, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you all for joining in on today's webinar. Um, perhaps we'll see you next week. We also have Can Do's Wednesday webinar, which is tomorrow because tomorrow is Wednesday. So thank you all for joining. Um, what a great presentation. I loved, loved, loved hearing the stories all across, you know, our nation. It's, it's good. It's good news. I love it. So I lift my hands to the work that you're doing. Um, thank you so much for coming in and sharing with us this afternoon. So everyone be well. I hope you have a good rest of the day. I'm going to head outdoors. It's beautiful out there. Take care. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thank you.